Now, there is a saying that predicting the future is a fun thankless task. How do you comment that from the perspective of your profession? Yeah, I think that's entirely true. I mean, I mean the p people who do my sort of work, we don't, um, anybody who's any good at it or, or, or thinks about it deeply would say that we never, we don't try to predict the future. We're not psychics. Yeah. And my job really isn't to be, isn't to be right. It's in many ways it's to be wrong, but in an interesting way, right? In that I had this realization a few years ago, which was that when I was writing scenarios for my clients, so one of the things you can do as a futurist is somebody comes to you and they say, hi, you know, this is my company or this is my country or whatever. Tell me what's going to happen. And you can write three or four different scenarios and say, well, if this happens, maybe this or if this, this. And they're really just telling stories. And I realized that all of my scenarios were true. Always. They were all true. It's just that they were always going to be true for 10 million people somewhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. right? So you could say that the future is, looks like Estonia, which it does. But it also looks like Tokyo, and it also looks like Nigeria, and it also looks like California, and it also looks like Miami, and it also looks like New York, and it also looks like the Arctic, and it also looks like Australia, and it's on fire, right? <laughs> and all of these things are true for 1 million people, or 10 million people, or 100 million people. And so predicting the future by saying, you know, okay, in the future, we will all do this, or in the future, we will all have self-driving cars, or in the future, we will all believe this, is both always true and is also always wrong. And so it's, much, it's a much more subtle thing of saying, okay, well, tell me what this is, you know, tell me who we're talking about, and then we can then we can discuss the influences that will shape where they go and how that ends up. But, we'll, but nobody can make a sensible prediction. And certainly anybody who stands on stage, for example, and says, I can tell you what the world will be like in 20 years' time, those people are, they're bullshitting, right? Now, it, it, like I say, they're not wrong, but they're also not right. And that's kind of a, I don't know, Sounds like a con artist, a, a little bit. Yeah, a, a little bit, and, and, and there is the risk of that, but there's also the possibility that you could tell stories which become um, inspirational, True. right? And so there's a, there's a great tradition of science fiction writers, for example, creating worlds which then engineers and, and uh, internet people and telecoms companies and so politicians on. Politicians even. The politicians, right. In the case of 1984. Well, that's a bad example maybe, but, <laughs> yeah. but, 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 but science fiction writers, you write a thing and then, and then technologists go, well, that would be cool, we should build that. Mm -hmm. and, that and they make it happen. And the trick, I think, is to choose the thing you want to build which has the happy ending. Like, it's fun to watch Blade Runner, but nobody wants to build that world, necessarily. Whereas there are some things like, there are some books which I think have been extremely influential, where technologies within those books become, in, become something that we can, we all look at and go, well, that would be quite cool if we could have that. So whether that's um, Neuromancer or Snow Crash or there's, uh, another Neil Stevenson book called um, A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer, which is a, basically it's a book written maybe 15, 20 years ago, but effectively it's the iPad. And it's the, but it's the iPad that adapts to children and teaches them things. And many people I know have been heavily influenced by that book in order to build that technology. And I think those are good things, whereas I do worry about people who watched Minority Report, for example, and think that the technology in Minority Report is a good idea. But this is, like I say, all of these things are true, both 100% true and also 100% false. Now, in the last five, seven, maybe even longer in your case, but in the mainstream media, the last five, four years have been a lot of talk about AI, about mm. Uh, about neuroscience uh, and, and so on. Uh, would, you, would you name out 
I don't know, one or two perhaps most um, most known innovations or technology that, that will impact us perhaps next year? <laughs> we can't say three years or ten years, but perhaps sure, next year? Sure. So there are many interesting innovations within the AI space. And I think saying talking about AI in general is can be very misleading. Yeah. But yeah. but there are some things which I'm particularly excited by. I would say that, that the first one that's very interesting and things that you can play with today and that people are using today in a very interesting way are the um, neural network models uh, specifically around language and around art. Mm -hmm. So there's one very, very interesting one called GPT-2, mm -hmm. which is a language model which you can train on text. So you can give it millions and millions and millions of words. It trains itself on that text and then you can use it to write things. So I have a, uh, I write a, a, a magazine column every month and last month I wrote the column with the GPT-2 AI where I wrote the first paragraph, and then the AI wrote the next paragraph, then I wrote the next paragraph, and we alternated. And it's not intelligent, it's not a person, so it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a writer, like it's not thinking about what it's writing. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's predicting what the next word should be, and you just keep telling it to predict the next word, and it will write sentences. Mm -hmm. It's very strange to watch it do it, but it makes it makes paragraphs, which makes sense. But the paragraphs, if you change the settings on the AI, you can make the paragraphs a little bit weird. You can make them slightly surreal. And what I found with that system is that if you train it on factual information, you can then have it write new paragraphs, new pieces of, of text, based on that factual information, which are a little bit strange. And that can be very, very powerful for giving you new ideas. Mm -hmm. It's not an independent tool. It's not a robot that can, that's a writer. It's not, it's not a robot that's a, you know, a, a, I use it a lot for national security uh, risk thinking. So I've loaded it with lots and lots of national security scenarios. It's not a national security advisor, but it's a really interesting tool to make me a better national security advisor. Mm -hmm. There's similar tools which, which work with art as well, where you can take a picture or two pictures and you can have a, an AI basically breed them what would happen if this was the mummy picture and this was the daddy picture? What would the child look like? And then you can change things to change the, uh, the way the picture looks. There are some other systems where, that again, that are being used today, where you can take, um, I, saw a I saw a system in use where somebody had taken the outlines of every car that had ever been made placed it into the AI and then told the AI to produce new cars based on this. And because it creates the outline of the car, you can then take that outline, put it into another system which would predict what the drag was of that, the aerodynamic drag of that shape. And this enables you to evolve new car shapes at speed. Now these are all AI systems. They all use machine learning. They all use the same AI models. They're called generative associative networks. Uh, sorry, generative adversarial networks. They're very, very powerful AI systems. But they're tools to make humans better. And so for, for me, I think the exciting thing about AI today are the AI tools that we can use to make us better in the same way as we use spreadsheets or databases or word processors or pocket calculators or rulers or pencils or any other tool that we've used in the past to make us humans better. I think today's the AI things that we have today that make us better at designing or writing or thinking or drawing 
creating new ideas. Those are the tools that are most interesting. Um, sure, yeah, we have self-driving cars and things like that, but those to me are fundamentally boring. I think, I think the self-driving car, for example, is actually fundamentally nostalgic. It's not about the future at all. Um, the self-driving car is just an, a, a way of trying to make the car still be a thing. Whereas actually, in most places, I think the future of the car is the bicycle. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to think more, I think we have to think a bit more deeply about what is truly forward looking and what is just using modern techniques to keep the future from happening. And the self-driving car to me is a conservative technology. It's something that prevents the future from happening rather than using GPT-2 and things like that, which are tools for making new ideas.